we can all see each other here and some of you can see the um the screen so we know people coming in through the samogakaya but um Betty, could you read out who's here virtually? We don't have it. We do. I can see him, I think. There's more than that? Okay. Um, well, I'll read what I have, and then you can help me finish. It's our good friend Harriet, our good friend Dirt, Kathy Brady, Charlotte, our dear friend, Autumn, who we all love, Chet, <laughs> Um, uh, Ashley, who I love with all my heart, and Andrew, of course, as well, and Greg, <laughs> Greg, all of you. If I've missed somebody, please help me. There's more. Okay, good. <laughs> we have to include everyone at this point. So I'm delighted that... Um, Reverend Dora Lee is here uh, for a second visit. There's been a break of three years, so I'm glad you're here. Um, she's one of the uh, priests at Valley Stream Zen Center here in town. The Rinzai tradition, we'd say Osho. Do they do you use that term, Osho? No, okay. So um, she has been uh, given um, permission to teach by her teachers, and she's. Uh, I'm going to speak um, to us on uh, Jisa Bosatsu, and she'll be doing, leading a meditation and ritual and workshop next Saturday. So I'd like to say a little bit about Valley Streams. Um, some of you may remember that uh, Jim Hare, so on, that's his, the name, right, so on? So yeah, here. yeah. So um, he was ordained here, and um, uh, I think that is a very special event to show inter sangha relationships. And um, uh, I feel very warm about uh, Jim uh, Son, and he's invited me to teach several times at Valley Streams. Um, people here mostly know that I've actually done quite a lot of Zen training also not making any claims of Kensho or Satori, but <laughs> <laughs> um, plus personal student of Suzaki Roshi, the Rinzai teacher um, who taught primarily in LA in the Southwest, um, passed away at 104. Wow. Um, also uh, studied strongly with uh, Korean Zen teacher, Sung San, Son Sanim, and um, various other Zen students. So people sometimes hear me throw in some um, references to Zen um, and participated also at um, Ring of Bone Zendo in North San Juan by Gary Snyder and Robert Aiken Roshi and um, Nelson Foster Roshi. Um, the criticism I sometimes have of Vajrayana practitioners um, is that uh, we don't do enough meditation, enough sitting, okay? Because um, people think, oh, I'm doing um, some fancy visualizations or I have some special impairments or um, yogas I do and I have bell and vajra and skull cup, so that takes a place. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, fortunately, uh, I studied uh, first with um, Chokum Trung Purimche, who was a good friend of Suzuki Roshi's and advocated that his students do a lot of sitting and participate in Zen groups too. So um, I've asked people here that are my students uh, to at least at least sit 20, sit shamata, uh, or let's say zazen, maybe at least 24 minutes a day, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's possible. Actually, more if you more is better too. <laughs> but uh, sitting isn't enough. Uh, sitting has to be as part of a context, and it's what we bring to sitting, and uh, the world we create through our uh, meditation. So that's why I'm delighted to have. 
Reverend Dorley talk about um, the ceremony and say whatever she wants to say, uh, which is going to be neat. I'm looking forward to it. And then I'm going to say a few things about our Jizo or Kashita Garba practice in the Tibetan Vajrayana tradition. So thank you. Please teach. Well, good morning, everyone. Is this working? Can you hear me? Good. I'm very um, excited to be here again. I can't believe it's been three years since I was here before to talk to you about the GISO ceremony. Um, because our last ceremony was right on the cusp of COVID and was one of the last events really at our Dharma Center for a long time. And it's just so wonderful to be see all of your new new color and paint and everything feels so alive here. And yet I can feel the energy of calm and peace at the same time. And so um so mostly I'm just here today to invite all of you to consider participating in our fourth Intersanga Jiso ceremony that will occur at the Sacramento Dharma Center next Saturday afternoon from 1 to 4 p.m. And this ceremony is really a ceremony to honor and to grieve loved ones who have died and all other losses whether it's the loss of a relationship or maybe the end of a job or you've just moved here um, or maybe it's a loss of a dream or even a recognition that you've exiled a part of yourself and there's some grief about that because a part of yourself hasn't been able to live. It could be grieving, you know, what's happening to Mother Earth or that we're still at war in so many places. Um, uh, all of you are welcome to come that carry that grief in some way. And um, it can be grief that's fresh, that's you're feeling right now, or it could be grief from long ago. Because grief unexpressed, unexplored, just lives inside, ready to come forth when the, when the time is right or the right context so this ceremony is meant to transform grief into a deeper opening of our hearts, a deeper ability to live fully and to have resiliency and commitment to how life goes. And the ceremony also recognizes that death and loss intertwine throughout our lives. So we will be creating community because I've learned that it's really hard to grieve alone. So we will be a community gathering together to create a safety because we all have decided to come with our vulnerability and with our, our feelings and our pain. And we will share this together in this ceremony, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit. Um, but part of the ceremony is that we will receive the presence of Jiso, which is just the Japanese name for the bodhisattva that carries us across the thresholds of life and death. Jiso also holds, holds us in when we're in fragile states. Uh, Jiso is the guardian of infants and babies and mothers. And Jiso is our guardian when we are struggling in a life situation. Um, so we come to receive the presence of Chiso. Um, and especially because this bodhisattva accompanies us into the hell zones. As far as I know, this bodhisattva is the only bodhisattva that has that capacity to go with us into hell zones and protect us so that we are not harmed and actually shines a light of wisdom while we're there um, uh, which transforms and, and gives us new insight into life. Um, so this bodhisattva, which is one of the reasons why the ceremony is so important to me, this bodhisattva is more ancient than the historical Buddha. And um, it's my understanding, and I know Lama knows more about this than I do, but it's my understanding that, that this bodhisattva was born in the 6th century B.C., and has the name Kashita Garba, 
which is still the name that's carried within the Vajrayana tradition. Um, but Kshita Garbha, which is translated as earth store or earth room. And today I just read that it's also translated as embodied heart mind. So Kshita Garbha is the bodhisattva that understands that in order to really embrace the mystery of, of life and death, we have to go into the dark. We have to go down into the earth. Um, and it requires a kind of courage to go into the dark, to turn towards what might feel uncomfortable or painful, because Kasita Garba is there with us and understands that when we go into the dark and grieve, something gets broken up or decomposed and becomes the fertility that then can create a new vision for your life. So um, my understanding of this story of the beginning of Kashita Garbha, whose earth store or earth room, uh, that it started with a Brahmin maiden whose name was Sacred Girl, or sometimes called Bright Eyes. <laughs> and Bright Eyes was deeply troubled when her mother died because she had defamed the three jewels and had been sent to hell. So Bright Eyes decided out of her grief to basically give away all of her possessions and turn them into um, offerings to the Buddha. She offered her possessions, she offered prayers for her mother to be spared from the realms of hell. Um, and she accumulated much merit. And so the Buddha actually gave her a vision and took her into the hell zone to see her mother and to also see that the Buddha, in, in response to her prayers, had taken her out of hell and into heaven. So Kashita Garba was full of joy at first, but then because she had gone down into hell, she had seen all the other suffering beings who were still down there. So she made the commitment that she would continue to be reborn so that she could go and help bring people and out of the hell zones. Um, so what's most important about this ancient bodhisattva, and I wanna say that this is part of why this is an inter-sangha ceremony, because Ishitagarbha, Jiso, this bodhisattva has threads that weave through all the major Buddhist traditions. So we have a Sangha from Sacramento Buddhist Meditation Group. We have Valley Streams, which is Soto Zen Buddhism. We have Sacramento Insight Meditation, which is Vipassana. And then we have Lion's Roar, which is Vajrayana. And, and we have a team of people who will be helping during the ceremony from each of these traditions. Um, so, um, so what is mo most important about this bodhisattva is that he, she evokes the fearlessness of non-duality. This means the truth is we are a part of everything and everything is a part of us. And this includes the living and the dead. <laughs> The dead are still with us, but in a different form. And so once we can access this interconnection through this ceremony, through the presence of Jiso, that gives us the courage and, and the perseverance to go down into the dark and turn towards our grief. Um, and if you remember, Thet Nhat Hanh says, a cloud never dies. It just changes form. And that's what this is all about. How do we enter all of these realms of aliveness? So, um, so Jiso offers us the energy. This isn't about kind of worshiping an, an idol or a statue of a bodhisattva. It's about experiencing these energies that will come in the ceremony of fearlessness, tenderness, determination, and the ability to listen deeply to the wisdom that starts to arise. 
So I wanted to, to share with you that a while ago, shortly after my mother died, I was traveling to Japan uh, to present at a conference. And after the conference was over, a group of us took a train to Mount Koya, which is this large mountain in Japan near, okay, uh, near Osaka. Um, and on that mountain are 118 living Shingon Buddhist temples. I mean, they're not museums, they're all practicing temples, practicing Shingon Buddhism, which um, started in Japan in 1805. But this too, Shingon Buddhism came from India to China and then to Japan. Um, so the founder in Japan is Kobo Daishi. And Kobo Daishi has a shrine at the top of the mountain at what they called the temple. And they call the temple at the end. <laughs> I didn't know that the temple at the end is actually this huge cemetery. So I we took a walk into this cemetery that goes back centuries. And there are, you know, gravestones piled up uh, up the mountain on all sides, some of them broken down um, on top of each other, um, Jiso statues everywhere. And when I walked in here and, and witnessed this, I was totally overwhelmed. <laughs> and I got scared and I said, what am I doing here? I've got to get out of here. I just couldn't tolerate the truth that was emanating from this huge graveyard, the truth that we all die. Um, but somehow this calm voice suddenly arose in me and said, no, don't run away, sit. And now as I, now I'm in learning about Jiso, I'm thinking, well, maybe that was Jiso <laughs> speaking to me with that calm voice of no, just sit, look at this truth. So I found a bench and I, and I sat quietly and I was calmer then so I could listen inside. <laughs> and after a while, this question arose and the question was, well, if we all die, <laughs> You know, what's the purpose of, of living? What's the purpose of life? You know, and this question wasn't an intellectual question. I realized, okay, somehow I'm asking the question. Um, and then after a while, something came. Um, love. The purpose of life is to love. And I was um, actually full of joy that I received this answer because somehow it like, I guess, broke open something for me. Um, and um, I realized I'd gotten this gift, but to live from love, knowing that we all die takes courage we actually have to kind of leap out of ourselves um, and take that risk to love. And that's the power of love, really. And um, I like to say this is the conundrum tremendum of human existence. Love and loss and death are built into the fabric of being human, are built into even what it means to love. So lately I found a definition of grief that um, I really feel makes the most sense. Grief is love expressing itself through healing to arouse love again. Grief is love expressing itself through healing to arouse love again. Because if we don't grieve, something closes off in us. We kind of harden inside. We get more afraid to be connected and to be intimate. Grief then becomes love expressing itself through healing. So that's what this ceremony is about, coming together to turn towards our grief for healing, you know, for awakening. Um, but me, one of the big questions is, well, how come grief is so painful? 
I mean, because mostly we don't want to feel it. It's too hard. And especially if we're by ourselves. Um, but an answer to this question that has been helpful to me, and also it becomes the sort of point of the ceremony, is that the pain of grief is because we're embodied beings that our love can only be expressed really through our embodiment. We touch, we hold, we kiss, we embrace, we talk, <laughs> we, we cook for each other, we make things for each other, um, we walk beside each other, um, we comfort each other. Uh, so, so our love really comes through our body and so when someone dies or there's a loss where we're not connected bodily anymore, it's a physical reaction. You know, we feel shock or our heart starts to pound or um, adrenaline rushes or we become depressed. It's all physical. So, um, so if we feel, think of grief as alive, it's love crying out then it needs to move and transform and return to the rhythms of life. So what we'll be doing in this ceremony, when you come, we'll all be in silence and there will be a big area in the middle filled with craft materials. And we will be invited to come and in a sense, let our hands make an offering to Jesus, to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> the conundrum tremendum. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, offering to Jesus, to Kushita Garba, to Jesus. I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> But this offering will be letting our hands express our grief. So it's not about making it look good, or it's not about thinking about an image of, oh, I think I'll make a heart or anything like that. What's powerful about this ceremony is you let your hands and eyes just pick. Like, oh, I want this red ribbon over here. Or what about this stick? Oh, I see that bright the pebble over there, I'm taking that. So you you actually trust that your hands and eyes are picking the objects that are needed to make this offering. And through that process, your grief starts to pour out and unfold. Um, so it's 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 very precious. And it's really between you and you, because we do it in silence. We're not like talking to each other, but it's a direct outpouring. And so after we've finished making our offerings, then we will have a ceremony where we each will bring our offering to the altar. And um, there's a chant that we will chant. It's Om Ka 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 Be San Ma E So A Ka. And it's calling the energies of Kishita Garba, of Jiso, to be present to receive our offerings and to transform our grief and our love into something that's beyond the physical, that's more than this one form uh, that has died. Um, so uh, then at the very end, we will process out to the Jiso garden. We will have prayer flags that we have made. This is part of the Tibetan tradition that will be part of it. We will write prayers and hang them um, on the trees in the Jiso garden for the wind to carry. Um, so someone said, when we approach grief with reverence, great things decide to approach us. So I'm inviting all of us to come together um, and share in this ceremony. And thank you for listening. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>
I'm not sure whether they checked with you whether it was okay to have your talk recorded or not. Oh. Okay. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Linear <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, time doesn't count, you know. Yeah. So, you know, we um, we generally try to post the talks on uh, YouTube, right? So you will be findable by others who aren't oh. here. <laughs> so. <clears throat> I'm uh, thankful to um, um, all the traditions that can come together and um, uh, blend and um, make some uh, new ceremonies that fit the uh, occasion. Mm -hmm. So the Jesus ceremony that we're going to do, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't find it exactly like that in Japan or in Tibet, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're 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 doing it. Um, uh, we're uh, making it up, so to speak, um, skillfully. So, Reverend Dorley and um, others um, have mm -hmm. uh, put it together, um, and um, that's the strength of. Um, American Dharma that we're we're willing to have mm -hmm. do enough training and practice so we're not just um, um, inappropriately making stuff <laughs> but uh, we have we have to do it right we have to create new new forms we have to create new ways of, of working mm -hmm. um, because ways of expressing grief in um, in Asia and uh, Tibet and China Japan are, very different lots of times in here in the West. Mm. Um, 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 it's different with different people in the West too. You know, funerals and memorial ceremonies are um, um, very different. Celebrations of life are all different. <clears throat> so um, we we need that. We need ceremonies and. Um, ways to come together and express things together and ritual um, helps us do things together. So we all have our private world going on, but the nice thing about rituals are all, we're all gonna do a song together, a chant together, a mantra mm -hmm. together, we're all gonna, so that, that reminds us that of interconnection and togetherness like that. Mm -hmm. So um, here we've made up, <laughs> They made up in um, um, Prasangika Madhumikan way that, um, that even though it's imputed, uh, it still is valid conventionally. Don't you think, Lontok? Mm. Yes. <clears throat> We're fortunate to have uh, a wonderful person in our lineage. Uh, uh, Mipam Rimshe, who um, was a polymath, uh, wrote and practiced on everything. So um, uh, I'd like to uh, read out um, as a reading transmission for you guys um, uh, a text that uh, Mipam Rimshe wrote called Praise of Kashita Garba. Mm. Mm. A beautiful adornment of the earth, a praise. So, ah, Kashita Garba, essence of the earth, you who nurture all beings. Like the underlying ground, you support qualities of many kinds. Like a wish granting gem, you fulfill the hopes of the three worlds. Lord of the ten boomies, to you I offer homage and praise. From stage to stage, you lead, establishing at the level of the victorious, like the earth's nourishing essence that yields a steady flow of produce. This earth that is replete with cry, with riches and many forms of bounty. To you, supreme deity of the earth, I offer homage and praise. You are like an excellent vase, a wish-fulfilling tree, clouds of perfection, or a lake of healing nectar. To think of you brings lasting splendor and magnificent. Embodiment of compassion to you, I offer homage and praise. 
the supreme qualities of the infinite victors and their heirs. You alone are the sovereign Lord of the treasury of space. And in the realms of the Bodhisattva's limitless ways, you uphold the victorious Buddha's activities. To you I bow. With the jewel-like rays of your boundless qualities, you overwhelm all faults and failings in this degenerate time and promote the glory of fourfold well-being. To you who perform great waves of enlightened action, I offer homage and praise. Instead of many eons of manifold vener veneration and prayer, Tamanji Goshe, Lokeshvara, Samantabhadra, Jita and the rest, Supreme Bodhisattva, heirs of the victorious ones, to think just for an instant of you alone will fulfill all hopes and desires. For this, you have been praised by the victorious ones as preeminent in the bestowal of wishes. O oh, foremost heir, inseparable from the victorious, through praising you, may you grant the excellent splendor of everything I wish for and desire. May beings throughout the three times discover strength of faith. May they be guided by you, the powerful Lord of the earth. May the earth's nourishing powers increase and happiness pervade the world. And may we progress from stage to stage and reach the level that is supreme. Oh, my home. Oh. 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 Many of the great teachers like um, Mipam Remshe wrote uh, praises, um, uh, which look like we're praising to an outside being. Um, but actually the praises help evoke, uh, as we know in Vajrayana, the qualities, uh, Buddha qualities that are inherent in us. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a Vajrayana point of view, um, particularly from Dzogchen point of view, which uh, like people to take in addition to Hinayana and Mahayana views is that um, Pishitagarbha represents, uh, you know, the the ground, the ground energy, or we'd say the earth energy, right? Mm -hmm. But um, for those people that um, uh, are interested in uh, Salang Tigle practice, the Tukor Yogas, uh, in the Dzogchen, um, uh, uh, earth is not always what it seems, you know? So uh, when we say earth and connecting with the earth element, um, it isn't just the physical earth, it's what uh, we call uh, the ground, as in ground, path, and fruition. So, uh, you know, what is the ground? The ground is uh, primordial awareness in our tradition. We call that the ground. Mm -hmm. From that, everything arises, both samsara and nirvana. So it's interesting, you know, so in, in our tradition, uh, we, uh, when we say uh, someone's really grounded, uh, we mean they're in touch with, uh, you know, the way things are, uh, basic space, uh, primordial awareness. So um, <clears throat> how does that connect with uh, our, our dirt ground and Kishida Garba? Well, in our tradition, we bring together like the Dharmakaya, which is complete open awareness, the Sambhogakaya, which is the uh, imaginal manifestations, and the Nirmanakaya, which is all of us sitting right here. Uh, three kayas are united, and this is the true mm -hmm. Vajrayana practice. So it's a difficult practice, right? We have to like uh, maintain uh, the fundamental view and uh, completely uh, open and contrived awareness. And we have to uh, be able to manifest all kinds of activities um, and uh, energies like Kishida Garba and Jizo. And then we also have to like uh, eat lunch after this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we have to have like frustration cloth and things like that. So uh, when we're doing um, bodhisattva DD yoga practice, um, we're doing um, you know what's called sambhogakaya practice, body of bliss. So um, um, Reverend Dorley pointed out that uh, uh, the love expresses itself very strongly through grief, um, and I'd also like to say that in our uh, strange tradition like uh, bliss is present in that grief too. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Mahasukha, or great bliss in this sense, isn't um, just normal pleasure or um, 
it's the bliss of awareness, the bliss of liberation. So when people go to memorial ceremonies, and there's frequently um, um, wonderful memories and, and cries of thanks and gratitude too, right? There's, there's bliss when we remember people in ceremonies and even when we uh, remember uh, our own losses and our own um, deaths. So when people do this practice from Vajrayana point of view, we, we remember to practice from the standpoint of the unity of the three kayas, the three bodies. So we totally embody awareness, totally embody uh, the imaginal world, and totally embody uh, the world of uh, form. So also, Kshita Garba is related to the world of um, you know, uh, earth in that way too, is that how do we, you know, uh, earth isn't um, real earth <laughs> is uh, hardness or softness, right? We touch something and we notice that something there and then it's hard or soft, correct? So, um, in that sense, uh, we're doing a uh, very profound practice uh, all the time, but we don't realize it. We're, we're uh, touching, touching the earth, even when we're just touching glass or cup or something. Mm. Thich Nhat Hanh very, um, was an eloquent master and poet, and he would talk about um, the Buddha's earth touching gesture and touching the earth and walking gently on the earth. You know, but um, if we want to integrate it into our yoga practices, um, we don't have to just do walking meditation, although I really am delighted that we've done it here in the past outside. Patty and uh, Doug um, have done that for years, making a large pitch for another walking here, Patty, obviously. So, <laughs> so uh, we're, we're connecting with the earth in a very... Um, gentle way where we notice, are we connecting hard or connecting soft? So when working with um, Kashita Garba from the Vajrayana tradition, um, we're, we're always bringing uh, the three kayas um, into practice, but um, you know, for the rest of the day maybe, or if you formally want to do some of this practice, then um, really um, get in touch with touch. It was just like what you know, just even like our own clothes, and you know, just touch is the earth, right? It's so profound. Usually, we just grab things, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, if we do um, the Kashira Karba from um, Mahamudra Sokchen perspective, we're seeing the absolute um, uh, nature of touch. So notice when you touch things, you know, uh, now, now I'm touching, it's kind of mindfulness. And then uh, we uh, touch dissolves and then as an object, and then it is going to arise as a perception, like hard or soft. And then we go through the various ways we work through the various levels of consciousness. So in that way, we're becoming Kishida Karva because we're literally in touch. So it's nice to sit on the ground, and I like people, nature folks, but um, it's also capable of being in touch if you're like an office person and you're just touching your keyboard, right? <laughs> it's okay to be grounded that way, like you can feel your, your uh, seat. Trunk Param Shade used to say a lot, like, hold your seat. It's kind of a horse riding idea. You know, it's like, it's going to do this. <laughs> so you're, you're in touch. But to make it a yogic practice, you, you want to um, join that with uh, the nature of awareness, the nature of imagination, and uh, the Nirmanakaya side is like, oh, no, there's something happening here. Is that hard or soft? that form, pleasurable, but just the touch aspect of form, just 
contact, right? That's most important in um, Sogchen practice so that people don't just think they're just being spaced out. So you're being spaciousness to the touch. Capish? <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to know um, more about what's going on, I can, we have time for some questions and answers. Mm -hmm. And are you willing to take some questions? Sure, of course. And Heather's out of the blocks first. And she will be getting, wait, it will come. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On Saturday, is there an age limit? Can I bring my two kids? Hmm, very good question. Um, They're uh, nine and 12, I don't know. Um, it's uh, sure, yes. Okay. If you can sort of explain, of course, how yeah. to participate, mm -hmm. and um, sure, we they're welcome used to be everybody. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> thank you. That was all. What time does it start? Starts at one. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And you can register on Eventbrite, by the way. I, I didn't say that, but um, I also wanted to say it's interesting because um, the three bodies of the Buddha is what we chant in our, our orioki meals yeah yeah mm -hmm. so i mean just i'm just interested in the interplay here um but i i also wanted to say um because something you said triggered it about uh being in the moment and allowing whatever arises to arise that that's part of what this ceremony is about. We're not talking to each other. We're sitting and letting something arise. And I mean, I, I want to invite you to come, even if you don't think you're grieving, um, because it's amazing what actually could happen that you don't know about. And when I first was doing this training, I went and I didn't think I was, I didn't have an immediate grief in mind. And um and I was sitting and I, I can't remember what I made, but making this offering, suddenly I had this flash, oh, I'm grieving that as an adult parent, I will never have um, an intact family because I have two stepchildren. And it's like, oh my God, I didn't know that's a loss for me. I didn't know I was grieving. But it just came. But when it came, it was sort of like what you were saying. It was like in this tender way. I felt love. I felt um, loved, I guess you'd say, by being shown that this is a loss that I can honor. Um, so even just to come with curiosity. Um, thank you. And thank you. We'll welcome your kids. <laughs> uh... We do have a question from Zoom. Uh, will we have this on Zoom or is it in person only? Oh, it's in person only. Um, yes. Okay. I wish we could do it that other way, but it's not this time. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question. Um, so this hasn't been going on for a little bit, uh, in years past, how long has this been going on? How many people usually come and, uh, can you sort of tell me, uh, you know, maybe how do you prepare? Like, do I need to bring anything? Oh. And afterwards, what do I do? Oh, <laughs> you're talking about the ceremony. Yeah. Yes. I didn't understand the first part. You said, how long, how long have you been, uh, doing these, these ceremonies? Oh, I see. Um, well, let's see, I probably, uh, I've had two years of training <laughs> to conduct these ceremonies, and I think I've conducted maybe six before to this week. So, but they're, they're meant to be, you know, sort of an, an event <laughs> rather than something ongoing. Although some of my colleagues do offer ongoing GSO um, groups, um, you don't have to bring anything. But some people bring like a like something that is tr precious to them to help them remember somebody, and that that's certainly welcome. Um, 
um, prepare is is really to make the decision to come, really. And uh, afterwards, um, afterwards, maybe uh, it's kind of open. You can you can be in touch with us for sure if something more has come up. But it seems like my experience is something gets completed in these ceremonies. Something gets released. So uh, there may be more grief, but it does have its own kind of integrity, I guess you'd say, the ceremony. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. Oh, other, other questions that I can pass the mic to? Well, it, it was moving to me that you were paying so much attention to the quality of the sense experience mm. itself and how that's part of the practice of being reverent and maybe tender or soft with how we relate to the world. And um, yeah, it feels like that can translate into making these offerings mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You know, how we... Um, relate to the materials of creation. Mm -hmm. So, in Vajrayana, thank you. In Vajrayana practice, we're primarily uh, trying to incorporate and imitate the uh, qualities, of course, of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Yeah. So um, mm. that's mm. why, like, um, uh, you know, relics or objects are. Um, not just objects in Vajrayana. Yeah. So uh, sometimes um, <laughs> I would say psychological Buddhists, you know, say, well, why do you, why do you why do you have rituals or why do you have a bell and scepter and all yeah. these things? Um, we have them because on a uh, inner level, uh, you know, our, our teachers touch them. You see, so um, generally. Um, you know, it's it's nice if uh, if if people buy a bell or something and bell or scepter on the internet, then you know, is bring it and you'd have your teacher touch it. You know, mm -hmm. um, same way as you might wear someone else's clothes, and um, you know, so the fact that someone is it's so big in traditional dharma, like if if a teacher has been there and touched the ground or yeah. touch this object, then you get to touch it too. And then you have this uh, commonality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it has that aspect of, um, the aspect of touch or connection, of course, is extremely important in Buddha Dharma. Mm -hmm. But um, um, mm -hmm. that's a big, you know, it's just huge. You know, if you think about with people you've loved or cared about and if you've held on to some things that they've had, um, you know, traditionally, even in Europe, you know, like um, a lock of, you know, you want a lock of someone's hair. Mm. I was reading an article about like Beethoven's hair, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in one of these museums, they're not sure, was it Beethoven's or not? Mm -hmm. You know, the provenance. <laughs> Poor Beethoven, he died. And then, you know, I, I think they just descended on him, you know, and, mm -hmm. They you know he's bald by the time you know <laughs> <laughs> but it it's it's a we want it we want to touch people mm -hmm. you know so um vajrayana is a is a high touch um mm -hmm. practice generally mm -hmm. like that so um we try to be gentle in our touch and responsible in touch but it, it's a high touch tradition mm -hmm actually, because there's so much to do with um, that aspect. Yeah. There's actually a sadhana, um, a couple of different sadhanas, um, practice texts with mantras on Kashira Garva. So maybe we can go into at some point um, mm -hmm. also. And um, there's a similar practice, actually, like um, uh, Dantan Gyalpa, um, uh, Tibetan Mahasiddha um, composed a text where Chenrezig uh, visits the six realms. Uh, mm -hmm. 
um, it's very good and popular. I do that too. Mm -hmm. So Chamezi um, manifests um, with different in the visualization. You of course you be if you've had the initiation, you become Chamezi, and then Avalokiteshvara, and then uh, you would have an implement that would, and iconographically, um, that would allow you to communicate with beings in the realm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the God realm, gods are just blissed out, but they won't listen, they won't listen to you unless you're a musician. <laughs> so um Chinraisi has a guitar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, my memories found me, but I think in the hell realms, Chinraisi, you know, would have a water jug, mm -hmm. right? You know, so sometimes we see with Kuan Yin, of course, manifestation, same as Chinraisi. She's pouring water. Oh. You know. Yeah, the Jiso uh, in the in the Jiso tradition of Jisos, uh, Jiso has a staff, and on the staff is rings with the keys to the six realms of existence, yeah. and then the wish fulfilling jewel. But the staff is to kind of wave in front as Jiso's taking you into the hell realms to sweep away all the evil spirits, <laughs> <laughs> so that you're safe. <laughs> Yeah, like the water jug, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to understand the symbolism of, you know, bodhisattvas and sabhogakaya buddhas, how they're different implements, you know, we, we have to enact them somewhat, you know, otherwise mm -hmm. they're kind of, um, you know, just kind of abstract qualities, you know, this embodies this, you know, we, we have to enact them. Mm -hmm. So a big part of Vajana, as people know, is, you know, we're, we're going to try to at least imaginatively enact mm -hmm. um buddha's activities right um symbolically many mm -hmm. of the mudras are you know enactments of you know offering food or water and so mm -hmm. forth like that mm -hmm. yeah but in the mahayana traditions uh dharmakaya sambhogakaya and nirmanakaya are, are really stressed sense mm -hmm. of embodiment yeah yeah right yeah so mm -hmm. la 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 right <laughs> la 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 <laughs> a few parting words um, of appreciation for the life of Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Some of you know he um, mm. uh, passed, you know, so mm. those those people that had the fortune to meet him, um, you know, are grieving, yeah. uh, uh, even though they know his mind is uh, mm. joined with the Dharmakaya. Um, you still miss people in the forum. Mm -hmm. um, we've been very fortunate and to have um, benefited from Lama Sopa's uh, um, translations and uh, textual activities. Um, very much benefited from uh, uh, participating uh, over the years and hopefully to come at Land of Medicine Buddha. Been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, to have um, monastics, um, both monks and nuns who have, you know, trained with Lama Sopa and Lama Sopa's FPMT organization, you know, come here, like, of course, um, Tenzin Chucky and uh, Venerable Steve. And um, so, uh, although we're not, you know, formally uh, members of FPMT, you know, we're close friends and, um, you know, very grateful for Lama Sopa's life and um, tireless activities. Amazing person that after a, a stroke and his bodhicitta and prayers, you know, just came back for the last couple of years. It's really, really amazing. Mm. Uh, so, and then uh, probably nobody here, maybe Dirk knows uh, Gyacho Rinpoche, uh, a wonderful Nyingma Lama who founded. Um, a number of centers in the Dujim Terasar lineage. Um, and uh, also uh, Tasha Choling up in Ashland, Oregon, you know, uh, you know, entered uh, Paranirvana and uh, down at uh, Half Moon Bay where he was staying, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So um, even when, uh, you know, teachers are completely fine themselves, um, uh, we grieve, right? You know, one time uh, many years ago, uh, um, 
when I had a chance, I would go down and, um, uh, you know, see La Malodra in San Francisco. And um, uh, it was shortly after uh, his teacher, uh, Kala Rinpoche, died. And of course, I took a number of different uh, impairments from Kala Rinpoche. Um, when talking uh, to La Malodra, Rinpoche is very open. And I said, well, how was it for you? And he said, well, when I heard uh, Kala Rinpoche passed away, I think in Sonata, you know, in India, he said, you know, of course, you know, um, no problem. The uh, um, Dharmakaya is there, you know, the teachers merge with the Dharmakaya. So he was fine, you know, you know, here you go. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know, yeah, of course, I'm a little sad, but. You know, I'm I'm good. I'm good, but um, of course, he went back to um, uh, India. You know, for the major ceremony after doing 49 days, whole thing, and uh, or maybe even sooner. Went very back soon, but you know, he, he was, it wasn't until he saw you know Ramshay's you know body. They kept you know in meditation. You know, actually there, you mm. know, Tibetans do that. Oh, yeah. You know, he just broke down. Mm -hmm. Just broke down. Mm -hmm. You know, big mm -hmm. time. You know, and I'm glad he shared that because sometimes we have this kind of like, mm -hmm. we're Buddhists, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know things pass. Yeah, we talk about impermanence every day, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, and I liked it that he just lost it, mm -hmm. just lost it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, it's like that. Right. It's like that. So we need ceremonies to do that. I mean, then we don't have to, um, <laughs> we shouldn't or don't have to wait around until you know, fantastic teachers pass away. <laughs> yeah. All know, the layers of yeah, the layers are there. Right. The, la yeah. the layers are there, you know. But lots of times it doesn't hit you until you kind of bring the, the bodies in, you start to embody it yourself and you're touching something they've touched or you're telling a story about them or, you know, or something like that. You have to like touch it. That's important. You have to, you know, so in our tradition, you know, Vajana has a matter, you, know, you can kind of, you touch it with your mind, right? Mind touch. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it, it doesn't just have to be physical touch, it's mm. mind touch. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Om Aaraya Pasa 